morning everybody. My name is Darlene and I have Parkinson's. I'm just going to sit here and talk for a little bit today. Um, I wanted to talk about how sometimes things get complicated when everything's not straightforward and when you come to your health things just sometimes are not straightforward. So some of us sort of feel like we've won the health lottery. We, uh, you know, catch every little thing that goes by. If it could happen, it does. Um, other people can go their entire lives and hardly be sick at all, never break a bone, never be in the hospital, you know. Nobody knows. There's only one maker for most of us. No matter who you believe in, there's usually somebody that you feel is in control of those things. For me, I, I believe it's my Heavenly Father, but the, it can be anybody. It can be a Buddha. It can be the nature that you adore. It can be whatever your personal beliefs are. But it's it's what it comes down to is it's not up to us what our choices are going to be. How we deal with it, that's up to us. How we um, handle everything that comes along, that's up to us. If we're fortunate and we have a, a wonderful, healthy life our whole lives, that's great. If we have a spouse that gets sick, we don't have any choice in that. We have to deal with it. So for me, I feel like I get everything that comes down the pike. I never was like that. I never got sick until I was uh, um, a fairly good age. I my, my first major illness was in 1999. Other than that, I hadn't had anything uh, much go on with me. I mean, a couple of minor surgeries, ganglions out of my wrists, um, but never anything major. 1999, then I found out that I had cancer and I wasn't um, prepared for hearing I had cancer. I, I didn't think that that was something that was going to come my way, but it did. And I successfully treat, got treated for my cancer. I have been clean from, from that for many years. It took me until 2010, from 1999, it took me until 2010 to get a five-year clean record because I, I had to sort of keep going back and doing more things and more treatment and whatnot. But in 2010, I got a clean bill of health from that. And we're now in 2021, and it's gone, and I do not have to deal with any ramifications of that. So I'm very fortunate in that. My husband was very fortunate in that. He, what year, Bill, did you get cancer? That was, you got treated in 2015, correct? Or two, yeah, because 16, we moved here. So you were treated in 2015, and my husband had colon cancer. Um, serious enough that we lived in Nova Scotia and he was told to have the family come if they could and see him when, when it was possible. So my children did come out and whatnot and he was treated. He had surgery. He had chemotherapy. He did great. The doctor said they had never seen Buddy go through the chemotherapy without any problems the way he did. He has always taken medicine. He's a constitution of a horse. He's always taken his medicine without problems with it. And we are very fortunate for that and very grateful. Then it comes to me. My mom got sick. I was under a lot of pressure. Mom died Christmas of 2010. I had gone, she lived in British Columbia. I lived in Nova Scotia, which was a long way away. I have a family that is commendable. Like, I, I don't know what words to say. But my husband said to me, go and be with her. We did not know how long she was going to be with us. We hoped that it would be a good long while. But we were told it probably would not. And so he just said, don't worry about things here. I'll take care of things here. You go without any questions and without knowing how long I would be gone. And it turned out that I was gone for a year. Now, I came home three times during that year. You came out once, didn't you, Bill? Yes. He came out to BC once and stayed for a few weeks. I went home three times and stayed home a week or two each time. 
Um, but other than that, I spent that year with my mom. It was the best gift that I could have been given to spend that time with her. Sorry. And I am forever grateful to my family for never questioning that that's what I needed to do. And I know my dad appreciated it. I know my brothers appreciated it. And, um, and I got to say, I always say my brother, which when I say my brother, I'm usually referring to Gary um, because Gary and I have spent much more time together than Grant and I. Um, but Grant is a wonderful person. That's the house that um, my father and my other brother, Gary, live in Grant and Kathy's house with them. And so I'm fortunate that I have lots of good family. Now, um, when mom died in 2010, I was unbelievably grief-stricken. And I kind of inwardly put it to myself because I'd been under stress for a long time because I had been away from my home. I had been staying with her. And, and as much as I was having a great visit with her and whatnot, it was very hard to watch her go through it. So when I came home in January, I, I let that stress kind of go. And I was sort of like, okay, now I have to figure out how I'm going to navigate my world as it is. And that's where I was at. And then I got up one morning and I had had a stroke during the night, mainly just because of stress. Now, it was not a serious stroke that required me to be in the hospital, but it was serious enough that when I got up in the morning, I realized that I couldn't open the fridge door. I couldn't hold a jug of milk. Um, I did everything I put into my hand just dropped and my husband phoned our family doctor who said you bring her in here right now we went in there and he looked took one look at me and he said you go over to the hospital right now he said you have had a stroke so I went over to the hospital and I was taken care of at the hospital like I said I had some damage to the right side of my body but I did a year's worth of physical therapy and during that year I started to get um, some of the use back of, of that side of my body, some strength back and whatnot. So I was on the road to recovery yet again. And then the Parkinson's came along. Now, we tried to blame it on the stroke at first. So did the doctor. He said, you can't expect to do the things that you used to do because you've had a stroke. You, you aren't going to be the same. You're going to be different. And I went along with that for a little while. And then I said to him, no, there's something else. I said, I was getting better. Now I'm not getting any better. I'm starting to regress. There's something else. And um, it did not take us. I did a little bit of research on my own. I kind of figured it was one of three different things. I had it narrowed down just with my layman's mind that it was going to either be MS, ALS, or Parkinson's just from the things that were happening to me. And I didn't want it to be ALS. That was my worst nightmare. I have had relatives that have passed away with ALS. I did not want that. Um, MS, I didn't really believe it was MS because I was kind of out of the age category for it. Um, it strikes younger people usually, but then Parkinson's, I didn't quite fit the category for that. I'm a woman, it more often hits men. It does hit women, of course, but it more often hits men. And um, yes, you can have young onset Parkinson's, but I was in my late 50s. And so I kind of thought to myself, I, I don't know if it is or it isn't, but it seemed like a logical thing. But I didn't have a tremor that was very, very noticeable. And that's what I thought of Parkinson's was somebody who had a tremor. So I know I'm rattling on here, but um, that to me... Uh, was what I figured I was going to hear. And sure enough, that is exactly what I heard. I heard that it was Parkinson's. And um, there's not a blood test for Parkinson's. I've explained that before. They usually, they can tell from symptoms what they, they believe it is. They do an MRI just to take a, a, a scan of your brain and to be able to compare it as you go down the line. 
but that doesn't give them the actual definitive, this is what it is. The doctor explained to me that what they, how they really tell is they give you what's called the gold medal um, medicine for Parkinson. It's the medicine that most people are put on um, and they, oops, oh no, the, I thought somebody was coming. Um, so they, they give you this medicine and if you respond to that medicine, that gives them the definitive answer. And so we started off with a dose of just four tablets and I, I felt like I was doing better, but I, it wasn't a definitive, yes, I'm doing better. But then at the time we knew that I was getting sick. The kids wanted us to be closer to them. So during all of this time, we were planning a move. We had four months to plan that move and we were going to move all the way across the country and come back from the Nova Scotia area to uh, Alberta where the kids were. And that was a, a very big move for us. And we didn't bring very much furniture. We brought some personal stuff. We mailed out Rubbermaid bins with personal stuff in it. And we basically said, when we get there, we're going to just buy some used furniture or cheap Ikea furniture and we will start with a little bit and we will just gradually build up. So we said to my daughter, can you find us a place to live? She said, yes. She looked in the seniors residences and she couldn't find anything. And she said, can I just get you an ordinary apartment and then we'll continue to look? I said, that'd be great. She got us an ordinary apartment, but it had a bathtub in it, which I had struggled to get my leg over the tub. But we took a year's lease and that's where we stayed for the first year. It was close to both of them, got us settled back in again. And I went to a new neurologist here. I did my waiting time and then I went and saw her. And she immediately said, well, first of all, four tablets is not going to give us our answer. We need eight tablets for you to be on a, a proper dose. And then we're going to see how that does. She put me on eight tablets within a week. I was feeling much, much better. And so we had our answer that that's what it was. And I think I still kind of wanted to deny it, you know, like every time I'd go to the doctor, I'd say to Claudine, maybe she's going to say this time, no, I don't think that's what it is. You know, like I, I kept thinking it was going to change, but no, it did not change. That is what it is. I've done the brain scans. I've done all the rest of it. And we know that that's what it is. Part way through, I've been here four years, came here in 2016. And about two years ago, maybe three years ago, I started noticing that I was having trouble with my feet. And I thought, oh, that's the Parkinson's. And I said to Claudine, I'm having trouble feeling the bottom of my feet. We started talking to people and whatnot, and we all, they all figured, okay, it's neuropathy related to the fact that I had diabetes. Well, I didn't feel like I had diabetes, to tell you the truth. I felt like I was fat, didn't eat very well, and therefore my blood sugars were bad. But that if I was eating well, that my blood sugars would be fine. And I didn't really feel like that was the answer, but okay, fine. You say I have diabetes and this is going to cure this. Let's do it because I can't handle not feeling my feet. Got me on all the insulin and the pills and all the rest of it. And you know, it did nothing. My feet still kept on going. Climbing up my legs. I was starting to really be numb halfway to my knee. And I said to Chloe, I said, there, that's not the answer. I said, now I, I started to eat properly. And sure enough, when I was eating properly, my blood sugars were fine. I said to her, this is not the problem. Well, Christmas time came last, yeah, last year, Christmas time, and we got COVID. No, first of all, she, the doctor put me on a medicine that I took a reaction to. And I got very, very sick for one month. I quickly deduced that it was that medicine, went off that medicine, and I recovered. No sooner had I recovered till we got COVID, which I don't wish on anybody. We managed to get through COVID, and I think it was January or February, I noticed that my hands were starting to lose feeling, and I had neuropathy in my hands, and they were tingling. And then one day, about a week after that, I could feel it going up my wrist. So we went to um, a doctor on an emergency basis. They sent me to an internist 
and he took one look at me and he thought it was was it was it something Graves or Mar Graves or I forget what it was called, but anyway, he thought it was this thing that can go up your arms, up your legs, and paralyze you to the point where you don't breathe. And he thought it was that, so he said to me, you have to be in the hospital right now. Well, they put me in the hospital, and I did not do emotionally well in the hospital. I, the Parkinson's has taken its toll on my mind, and I cannot stand being by myself. With COVID in the world, people weren't allowed to visit me, and I was stranded in that hospital, and I just felt horribly alone and my my mental state was bad i feel very very bad because i would phone my daughter and on the um messaging thing and i would say to her cutting come and get me i would just cry come and get me and she said i can't mom like you need this medicine i said they're not giving me any medicine i said they're taking me for tests but i'm not getting any medicine or anything and it's still happening so they gave me some nerve conducting tests and they said that this woman does not have that. She doesn't have that terrible syndrome that I'm glad I didn't have, but there was never an explanation for what was going on with my hands and feet. They don't, it can't be the blood sugars because my blood sugars are fine. I no longer have to take any of that diabetic medicine and my blood sugars are fine. My weight has come off and I am fine with that. But my hands and my feet have very little feeling, which is why I drop everything. So you're dealing with neuropathy, Parkinson's, previous stroke. I said, the doctors are doing their very best, that's for sure. But when you don't have a straightforward case, they can't do any more than what medicine allows. Um, for my Parkinson's, I am up to 18 of the gold medicine. Um, I'm at one milligram of a patch. I see the doctor on the 7th. I fully believe I need to be up at the two milligram patch. The patch has very bad side effects and I'm scared of those side effects, but I'm also scared of sitting in my chair and having no life. So, um, I am trying very hard to do everything that I can to keep myself motivated, to keep myself going, to be calm when I have my downtime, and to, to just try to get through. Again, family, very, very important to me. And the reason for these videos I have said is to give my kids a record. I want them to realize that no matter what happens in your life, fight for everything you need. Don't give up. Keep on going. And that's what I plan to do. Keep on going. Now, I'm going to end on a funny story, of course. The pastor that I was telling you about yesterday, um, who was praying on the coffee table and Bill thought he was sleeping or, or, or ill. The same pastor. Oh, boy. Life was different back then. There, the things that we did, you legally wouldn't get away with now. But anyway, we were up in Quinell, and I was terribly lonely, and I wanted to see my friends and family. We hadn't lived up there very long, and I was seven months pregnant when we moved, and I just wanted to share my baby with my family for a little while. So I was going to go for a couple of weeks. So Bill said he couldn't get any time off work, and he said, I could take you down on a weekend, but he said, well, we'll see what, if we can get you a bus ticket or something. Well, the pastor heard him talking about it, and he said, hey, I'm going down to Vancouver and taking somebody down um, for a, a trip to the rehab center or something. He says, why don't they, the kids and Darlene come with me down there. I'll drop them off to where, where her parents are. And then he said, I'm going back down in two weeks. I'll pick them up. We said, that'd be great. What we didn't know was he wasn't taking the family car, which was the big car. He was taking a Volkswagen. Now, anybody who knows a Volkswagen bug knows that basically there's two seats, the driver and the passenger. Okay, that's the pastor and the fellow going to rehab. Then there's like a little tiny seat in the back. That was gonna be me, a baby, and my daughter who was 10. 
except for that at the last minute, they had to take a bunch of box stuff, baked goods and whatnot, down to the students that were down at Bible College. So they thought they would load the back seat till it was level, and then the baby and myself and Claudine would lay like on a blanket in the back on this trip from Quesnel through the mountains and down to Vancouver. First of all, you would never get away with that. No, no car seat, no seat belts, laying on top of a bunch of boxes, five of us in this little Volkswagen, you would legally never do that. But anyway, back then, if there was rules about it, we didn't know. Uh, none of us knew. I don't know if there was rules about it or not, but that's what we did. Well, we get in this car, and I think to myself, it's only a nine-hour drive. I'm not going to worry about it. Like, we'll get there. Then he, he says to us in the car, he says to Claudine and I, he was trying to amuse Claudine, I think, and he says to her, do you know what happens to me at midnight? Because we were traveling overnight, and Claudine goes, no. And he says, it's the strangest phenomenon, he says, but at midnight, he says, I turn into an Englishman. She says, what do you mean? And he says, I, you would think that I was born in, in London, England. He said, I turn into an Englishman. And Claudine says, Mom, can that happen? I said, well, I've never seen it happen. But I said, he's a pastor. Why would he fib to us? So anyway, we waited to see what would happen at midnight. Stroke of midnight. The man starts talking in an English accent. And I expected him to carry it on for 10 minutes and, and then be done with it. You know, he carried it on for the entire journey. He carried it on all the way to Vancouver. And it wasn't until we were dropping us off and he goes, Oh, I'm so thankful that I'm back to myself. He said, that was a long night. Oh, I said to Claudine, oh my goodness. I said, that doesn't really happen in real life. But it did to us. And she often says to me, do you remember when that pastor talked in an English accent all the way down? She doesn't remember laying on top of all the boxes and stuff, but she sure remembers the English accent. <coughs> anyway, I've rattled on long enough. So I'm going to just la laugh with you and say, I'm so glad that we can share this time. All right, see you tomorrow.